last speaker at this point needs no introduction because he's been introduced before. But uh, Rafi Landovitz is a professor of medicine at UCLA Center for Clinical AIDS Research and Education. He's also the center co-director of CHIPS and he's led combination prevention intervention studies and projects using post-exposure um, and pre-exposure strategies for MSM and transgender women, as well as being part of the leadership groups of AIDS funded AIDS clinical trial, the H HIV prevention trials network, and former adolescent trial network. He rec recently completed a term as the chair of the ACTG antiretroviral strategy scientific committee is the principal investigator of two multi-site PrEP demonstration projects in Los Angeles County and leads the NIH DAIDS funded phase two and phase three registra registrational clinical trial evaluating long acting injectable cabotegravir for PrEP. He has received multi multiple awards and accolades and is recognized worldwide and his research agenda focuses on optimization of the use of antiretroviral medication for both prevention and treatment, and he's going to speak specifically about long-acting agents. Thanks, Elaine, and thank you all for staying this late in the afternoon, and I'm sure you're really sick of me already. Um, but I am going to be talking about long-acting agents for both treatment and prevention, and we're going to go a little fast to make sure we have enough time um, for questions. These are my disclosures, um, and uh, uh, this is our learning objectives for today. Um, so I'm going to start with long-acting injectable treatment. So the, the, um, the regimen that we have approved currently by the US FDA that we've been talking about multiple times today already is long-acting cabotegravir in combination with long-acting rilpivirine. And I'm going to briefly go over the registrational trials that led to its approval, then we'll move forward. So um, as we heard this morning, um, uh, one of the two registrational trials is a trial called FLARE, and this was a trial in truly antiretroviral naive individuals, right? So these were people who had never been on ART before. Um, they were given an induction period of an oral conventional dolutegravir-based three-drug regimen for um, uh, until they got uh, to undetectable, um, and uh, then uh, when they got to undetectable, they were randomized to either stay on their oral ART, which in this case was a Bacavir 3TC dolutegravir, um, or randomized to cabotegravir rilpivirine. And they started with a, a four-week oral lead-in of those agents to establish safety and tolerability, and then there was a direct head-to-head -head comparison um, of the oral arm compared with the injectable arm. The primary endpoint was at 48 weeks. These are the results of that study. It was a non-inferiority study, incredibly high levels of virologic suppression in both the injectable arm and the continued oral therapy arm. Not a whole lot of surprise here, except I'm going to ask you to keep in mind that this population was entirely antiretroviral naive, right? The companion study to it um, was the ATLAS study, and these were people who could be suppressed on any first or second oral regimen. And I'm, you notice I'm calling it first or second, not first line or second line, because they could only have switched from a first regimen for toxicity. They could not have had previous virologic failure. So these people could have been on an NNRTI, a PI, um, based regimen or even an INSTE based regimen and then when they were undetectable they were randomized um, to either stay on that regimen or again uh, to switch to the cabotegravir rilpivirine regimen again primary endpoint at 48 weeks and again a four-week lead-in of the oral um, cabotegravir and rilpivirine products before giving the long-acting injectable versions of them to establish safety and tolerability Keep this study in the back of your mind because we're going to talk about a modification to it called Atlas 2M in just a second. So these were the original Atlas results, and again, a non-inferiority study. You can see the injectable arm in sort of the reddish color and the um, continuation of the ART arm um, in the orange. Again, really high late rates of virologic suppression. And it was on the basis of these two trials that the FDA 
um, approved this drug for maintenance, this combination of drugs, for maintenance of virologic suppression um, for HIV infection. And the most important thing to remember about this is the current and original FDA approval says that you have to be undetectable to deploy this. The current FDA approval and guidelines suggest that this oral lead-in that was studied is actually optional because there was no excess of hypersensitivity or other serious adverse events that seemed to have been screened out by this oral lead-in. So it's entirely optional now moving forward. You can go quote unquote direct to inject when using this, but I kind of hate that term because people then think you can deploy injections in any clinical context and really just remember the current FDA approval and we've sort of been getting to this point all day of talking to the data for the use of this regimen in non-suppressed individuals but the FDA approval still remains as of today um, uh, that it can only be used in the context of virologic suppression. So fascinatingly, although the FDA approved that drug administered, that combination of drugs, at an every four week interval, the European Medicines Agency knew that Atlas 2M, which was the same medication, slightly different dosing, at two month intervals was coming. And so the European Medicines Agency actually deferred approval of the combination of cabotegravir and relpivirine long acting until the results of Atlas 2M came along and they actually never approved it as a four week monthly regimen. They've only approved it as an every two month regimen. Here in the United States it has FDA approval for either. So the study design was these were people who were in the Atlas study. Remember Atlas, any, anyone um, who is on a first or second regimen suppressed, randomized, oral or injectable, primary results, non-inferiority, now an opportunity of a subset to re-randomize either coming from the oral or coming from the one monthly injectable to injectable cabril pivorine, everybody every four week versus every eight week, okay? These are the results. You can see that overall the rates of virologic suppression were pretty equivalent, again, not inferior in the every four week versus every eight week arms. However, devil's in the details, right? We've all been machinating all day about what are the virologic failure rates with these injectable regimens when they are taken perfectly, right? And this is sort of the million dollar question, right? What is the opportunity cost of the convenience of having an all injectable regimen. And we've heard a number of times today from a number of different cohorts, observational, randomized, and real world, that the rate is somewhere between one and 2%, even with perfect injections, right? And that is, we believe, a higher rate of virologic failure than you would otherwise have with perfect adherence to conventional daily oral ART. So it appears, and these are sort of difficult comparisons to make, that there is a slight opportunity cost to going on these injectable regimens. And you know, we've seen the, this, this graph already very briefly and in passing earlier this morning, but um, this is the um, sort of survival curve for um, loss of virologic control across all three of those registrational studies that I mentioned. And what you can notice is that the majority of the dropping of those lines from um, the initiation point on the left side of that axis is upfront, right? There's very little additional sinking of those lines after about one year on therapy. So most of the failures happen within the first year, but that's not to say that it can't happen late. And I think the thing that gives people pause about this, particularly when you look at the comparison of the every four week versus every eight week data, although the statistical result was non-inferiority, numerically there were more virologic failures in the every eight week arm compared to the every four week arm. And the sine qua non of failure of cabotegravir rilpivirine as a treatment regimen is most often resistance to both classes of drugs. So if you're gonna fail 
or let's rephrase that, if the regimen is gonna fail you, it's gonna fail you in a very consequential rate way with regard to what you're gonna be able to use subsequently. And that's what I think the anxiety is about this class of agents. And many people, I think, when they think about cabotegravir or pivirine as sort of the next thing in antivirals, and we've heard about many of the things coming down the pike at Croy, is this is, for those of you who've been in the HIV field for a long time, this is really the sequenavir of long-acting treatment, right? Was sequenavir good? Yes. Did it change HIV treatment? Yes. Was it the best thing ever? Not by a long shot, right? So this is our first iteration of long-acting treatment. There is going to be better things coming down the pike, okay? This is what I mean by the concern, right? So these are two virologic failures, one from the every eight-week arm, one from the every four-week arm, um, of Atlas 2M, and the long story short is um, you're getting high-level integrase and non-nucleoside um, uh, reverse transcriptase uh, inhibitor resistance when you have confirmed virologic failure on these regimens. Now, the other side of that is, and I think many of us who take care of people with HIV are getting this in spades, is people want this. I know as a provider and as a researcher myself, when these studies were being conducted, my thought was, people aren't gonna want this. Who's gonna want these big three milliliter injections that's two buttock injections every four or eight weeks? Sounds miserable, injection site reactions. No one's gonna want it. Boy, was I wrong. Right? People, I'm sure we've all heard these stories, that the chronic fatigue of being reminded every day and taking these pills every day, um, it takes a toll emotionally, stigma-wise, um, and people get fatigued from it. And this has been life-changing for a large number of people who are long-term survivors. And so the satisfaction results, I think we cannot minimize. It is 100% clear people want this. Some people want it for convenience. Some people want it for all these other reasons. Some people want it for the discretion of not being seen carrying around the pills, particularly when HIV is still so stigmatized, even in 2024. So, you know, I think a lot to be said about this as a field as we've been talking about all day. So you've already seen these. Um, these are the current DHHS treatment guidelines for the context in which this regimen of long-acting cabotegravir, long-acting pivirine can be used. You've seen on two different previous talks that now IAS USA um, uh, has amended their guidelines to say, well, if you have somebody who is viremic and they can't take daily oral ART and their T cells are low and you can support them, maybe it's okay to use this in other contexts, right? So we're being more permissive. It's still off-label. The FDA has not and likely will not in the short term change the approval for this, at least not for frankly viremic people, but I think as providers, we all want to do what's best for our patients and sometimes that means going outside of what are the regulatory approvals. I'm gonna take a moment and pivot and talk about long-acting prevention. We've been talking a lot about um, treatment today. We've talked a little bit less about prevention. Prevention's what I spend most of my time thinking about, so I'm gonna take a moment and talk about that. Um, half of the regimen that we've been talking about, the cabotegravir half of it, is also FDA approved as monotherapy for long-acting pre-exposure prophylaxis. I'm sure everyone in this room is already aware of that. These are the two studies that led to that FDA regulatory approval in December of 2021. They were called HPTN 083 and 084. They were identically designed sister studies. One was in cis men and trans women who have sex with men, that's 083. One was in cis women in Southern and Eastern Africa, that's 084. You're gonna say to me, I didn't hear you say transmasculine populations, non-binary people or people who inject drugs. Correct, those people have not been studied. It's a huge data gap. We can talk about it at the end if people are curious. But those were the two studies that contributed to the FDA registration. Um, they took HIV uninfected but people at risk, randomized one to one to basically a cabotegravir strategy or a daily oral TDF-FTC prep strategy. There was an oral lead-in. This was a double-blind, double-dummy study. So people got one active and one placebo product. No one got both active. Nobody got both placebo. So people for that 
oral lead-in period, we're getting two tablets a day, a cabotegravir and a TDF-FTC, one active, one placebo. And then if there was acceptable tolerability and adherence, they went on to the direct three-year oral to injectable comparison. The people who were in the TDF-FTC arm got a sham injection every two months on the same schedule that they would have been getting active cabotegravir. It was 20% intralipid, in case you were wondering, because it looks and has the same viscosity as the actual cabotegravir. Trivia, little known facts, now you know. Um, anyone who stopped um, the injections early went over to this thing we called step three, which is basically uh, a year of open label TDF FTC prep to give ongoing biomedical prevention for people who were at risk as the long acting cabotegravir washes out of your system. These are the results of those two trials. A Lot of stuff on this slide, I'm gonna break it down for you. Left side of the slide, 083, cis men and trans women. Left side of the left side of the slide, blinded period of the study. Basically, an almost 70% reduction in HIV incidence in the injectable versus the oral. Left half of the slide, right portion of that left half of the slide. When the DSMB stopped that study early for superiority, it was the middle of the pandemic. It took a year to amend the protocol and get drug supply to be able to offer everybody the superior product. Good? No. Real? Yes. So what that means is we have an extra year of data with people actually on their original randomized study regimen before they crossed over to a choice situation. What you see there is about 65% reduction in HIV incidence, oral to injectable, but weirdly, HIV incidence doubled in both arms. I don't know why that is. It's not entirely attributable to less adherence um, as people were on the drugs longer. So would love to hear your thoughts on why that is, if you have any, um, I don't know why that is. Right half of the slide, cis women um, in Southern and Eastern Africa, stunning result. You all know that the studies with TDF, FTC for PrEP have really struggled to show even individual level, but much less population level efficacy for daily oral PrEP for vaginal exposures, right? It's been one of the biggest frustrations about the oral PrEP field. Here you have a study where the same study design resulted in a 90% reduction in HIV incidence in the cis women, presumably overwhelmingly exposed vaginally um, compared to the daily oral TDF FTC arm. And again, the same thing, the DSMB stopped that study early for superiority in November of 2020. Same story, pandemic, supplies, amendment, extra year of follow-up, their incidence didn't change. So I don't know what's different between these populations, but still 90% reduction in HIV incidence, incredibly low incidence rates overall in all of these arms. These are all stunningly successful results. The, the answer here is not TDF FTC is bad or doesn't work. That's not, that's not the conclusion here. The conclusion here is TDF FTC works really well if you take it. Look how much better an injectable product covers sex acts for people who struggle with adherence. That's the take home message from these studies. So now I've talked about this in the case study portion of this, but we all mentally machinate, wring our hands and bang our heads against brick walls about the times when injectable prep fails. Again, it's an incredibly rare event. In cis men and trans women, it's about 0.15 per 100 person years. It's even lower for cis women. But what did we learn when we take a microscope to these PrEP failures? And you know, we're all fascinated by this because we don't have a good explanation yet. Well, we learned something that we knew from the oral PrEP world. If you don't take it, it's not gonna work. For some reason, every time I say that in a talk or a lecture, people are surprised by that. They go, oh. You all know this, right? I mean, how many of you, you don't have to raise your hands, but think about it. The doctor gave you a prescription for, you know, 10 days of penicillin, 400, you know, four times a day you had to take it. How many of you took it exactly as prescribed? Don't answer. I know, right? I mean, it's hard. It's hard to be adherent on a daily basis. Okay, if you do not find prevalent acute primary HIV infection before you start long-acting injectable prep, 
it's going to be the devil to find. It goes underground because of the long-acting nature of the product, and it becomes incredibly difficult to diagnose. That means the burden, the onus, the extra effort really needs to be put in before you start somebody on long-acting prep to make sure they are not in the throes of acute HIV infection. Because if you start it, and they were, and you didn't find it, it's going to be super difficult to find. So, during the development of this product, we realized that the drug, after a last injection, has a very long, what we call, pharmacokinetic tail, right? And it turns out it's different by the sex assigned at birth. So, for individuals born male, if the, after a last injection, the average length of time that it lasts in the body is about 40 weeks. The average length of time it lasts in the body of someone born female is about 60 weeks. The ranges on those are enormous. The longest we have modeled any injection to last in someone's body is someone who is, was born female, and it was modeled to have lasted two and a half years after their last injection. There was still detectable drug in their system. So this thing lasts and lasts and lasts. We call that the tail, right? And during the development of this drug, we rang our hands, oh my God, the tail, the tail. Even if this drug works as a prep agent, after you stop it, at some point, the levels start coming down and down and down and down. And then at some point, it's not protective anymore. And then if you acquire HIV during that tail, there's drug around. And so you're going to select for integrase resistant. And then the whole world is going to blow up in a great ball of fire of integrase resistance. And if you remember when TDF FTC prep first was coming out, right, all the doomsday modelers were saying, we're going to have a tenofovir resistant epidemic and the world is over, right? And, you know, here we are and that didn't happen. So I'm going to ask you to sort of, you know, we're all going to take a deep collective breath and not think that, especially because I'm going to tell you, spoiler alert, we did not see integrase resistance when infection happened during the tail. But... We did see it in every single one of the cab prep failures that happened with on-time injections. So it wasn't in the context of the tail, the declining in um, cabotegravir concentrations that led to resistance. It was failure at high concentrations. Now, nothing is perfect. And again, I said this at the beginning. I'm going to say it again. This is an incredibly rare event. But when it happens, when the on-time injections are on time, that's why they're called on time, um, and it fails, that's where you get integrase resistance, okay? The other thing we learned is this idea of giving somebody oral meds when they want an injectable product doesn't work. Nobody took it. So a lot of the infections that we saw during this tail when we were trying to cover the tail were actually in the context of no evidence by either plasma or dried blood spot monitoring biomarkers of adherence of people actually taking that oral prep product that we gave them during the tail. So no matter what you might tell people to do, right, if they're not going to succeed on an, on an oral drug, don't ask them to take an oral drug. Um, there's an onset of protection with this product. We know what it is very specifically for tenofovir-based PrEP, right? It's been around long enough that we really know the onset of protection for rectal protection, for vaginal protection, for parenteral protection, and how long it lasts when you stop it cold turkey. We do not know those numbers for cabotegravir. I can tell you what I think the numbers are, but it's not based on human data. It's based on pharmacokinetic modeling and non-human primate data. So until we have those numbers, I think a lot of providers are super twitchy about knowing what to recommend to people about how quickly they're protected when starting this product. We don't know. Um, so I mentioned this during the cases also, but the biggest surprise, bugaboo, complication, thing you have to know when using cabotegravir prep, and I believe that this is a prototype. This is gonna be true for all future long-acting prep agents. If lenacapavir is successful, I bet you this is gonna be a problem there. If BNABs, I know Paul Sachs just like exploded in effigy, um, uh, um, it, you know, turns out to be prevention agents, they're gonna have this problem. You know, or monthly oral prep, if that is successful, that's gonna have this problem. That's my prediction. What the problem is, is because you have a long acting agent, when it fails and nothing is gonna be perfect, nothing, I'm sorry, it's just true, 
right? What does it do? You have an antiviral agent that's sustained in the body. Of course, the breakthrough viremia is gonna be low level, right? Because there's a countervening force of that antiviral still at high concentrations in the body, right? So what we end up seeing with cabotegravir is this smoldering of the viral load right at the level of quantification. So it creates this enormous conundrum of if you're screening with RNA, which is part of the CDC and FDA guidance for cabotegravir prep, and you get detected less than 20, what do you do with that? Is that the first sign of breakthrough HIV infection or is that a false positive? Even if it's 200, what do you do with that? Is that real or is that a false positive? And how do you disambiguate these? This is the biggest challenge of clinically implementing PrEP with cabotegravir after you actually get it, right? Which is actually the biggest challenge. Okay. Um, and so the antigen antibody testing also is delayed because the viremia, the antigen that's, that the antibody is responding to, right, is at such low level. So our conventional diagnostics are delayed in detection here, right? And I mentioned this, if, if you get PrEP failure um, with on-time injections, you can get cabotegravir and other integrase resistance in a way that would predict that you likely um, uh, would not respond to a dolutegravir or bictegravir-based regimen. Um, if you find that infection early enough using RNA screening and it actually is helpful, you can actually find these breakthroughs before there's integrase resistance. And it was those data that actually made the FDA and the CDC make that recommend recommendation that the screening for cab prep failure be the combination of the RNA testing and the antigen antibody testing. And I hope that makes sense. The one thing I am gonna tell you though is all of these data and those guidelines and that FDA approval were based on retrospective data. What was actually done in the study was a rapid test, then people got injected, and at the same time, a, a laboratory-based blood sample for antigen antibody testing was sent, and that resulted after the injection was given. That's all that was done prospectively in the study. All of this RNA stuff that I've been talking about, that was done on stored retrospective samples. So I can't tell you what the false positive rate is for RNA screening in this context. I will tell you both 083 and 084 are now in open label extension phases where we're doing that RNA testing that you all are being forced to do in the clinical setting as part of a well-controlled study. I hope to be able to tell you the positive predictive value, the false positive rate, the sensitivity and specificity of RNA screening in this context at some conference, perhaps even later this year at, I don't know, maybe while you're eating a pretzel and drinking beer, I don't know. But you know, I hope to have that information for you soon. This is what I'm talking about. This is Levi that I mentioned um, in the case um, portion when we were talking about it. Just to orient you, the x-axis, the weeks on 083 study enrollment, the y-axis, cabotegravir concentrations, the orange dots, cabotegravir concentrations at various time points, the green lines when people got cabotegravir injections. So the reason those orange circles on the left side are not connected is because that's the oral lead-in. I don't know what happened between those measurement time points. It's oral dosing, right? Unless you have like pill cam at home and you're watching everybody, you don't know what people are doing. I can only tell you what happened at the two times we measured it. Once you start giving them injections, it's a reasonable assumption that there's gonna be a linear, linear um, path from one measure point to the other. What you can see here is this person seemed to have taken their oral drug well, those are good levels, and then they get serial injections, they've got good concentrations. That first blue line is the time point when the site found evidence of the infection on that either rapid or antigen antibody based test. When we went back retrospectively on stored samples, that red line is where we found the first evidence of the infection. The central laboratory testing is up there on the top. And what you can see is that the first breakthrough, the viral load was 6.1 copies, retrospective testing. You wouldn't have found that on your regular RNA testing, right? Might have come back detected less than 20, might have come back not detected, who knows? The Aptima test was positive, right? How many of you are running Hologic Aptima tests all the time in your clinical practice? 
said no one ever, right? Um, good news, the new Hologic test is much less expensive and is able to be run on a Panther platform, so it's actually much better and you actually can do it much more readily, but historically it was very expensive and old, right? But the point is, this was delayed in, de in detection by almost 100 days, and by the time people found it, it was highly integrase resistant. Too late. So that's an example of Levi. Here's a cartoon about Levi. Um, so on the right is what we think about conventional acute or primary HIV infection, right? The RNA goes up, it's an explosive volcanic burst of viremia, right? It's symptomatic mononucleosis-like syndrome, we talked about this. And then, you know, the blue line is the antibody and it shows up later, usually when you're at the set point and there's a little bit of immunologic control, right? This is what happens in Levi, right? So here's your cabotegravir and your cabotegravir injections and your concentrations. Well, so the RNA, it goes down, it kind of smolders. Sometimes it pops up and there's resistance right away and that's why it escapes. Sometimes it doesn't. It doesn't until the cabotegravir starts to wash out. And then perhaps even more frighteningly, sometimes it just stays down all the time and you can't find it until way after you stop the cabotegravir. What happens with the antibody? Same thing. Sometimes it comes up with the RNA. Sometimes it doesn't, or it comes up a little bit, and then it goes back underground. And then it shows up again with the burst of viremia. And then the most fun situation is when it stays down and you're having a really hard time, even years after you're trying to start this diagnostic process. And resistance evolves over time. So that's the concept of Levi, and it's clinically silent or protean. This is a comparison of the difference. This will be in your slide set. I'm running out of time, so I'm not gonna go into this in detail. The things from my standpoint that are really important to think about are three domains when you're worrying about this, right? Is there a risk to the patient? Probably not, it's low level viremia, right? So it's not gonna have immunologic consequences. Are there risks to sexual partners? Probably not, because the viral load is super low while this is happening. But are, is there a concern for the blood supply? I'm concerned. Um, and, and then, is there concerns about resistance? Answer, yes. Um, so that's why the RNA screening is super important there. Real world data, I'm gonna zip through this, right? Um, Dr. Sachs already talked about the TRIO cohort for cabril piverine treatment, that the suggested breakthrough rates really are this one to two percent, super exciting. He presented some updates from Croy this year, so I'm not gonna belabor this. He also told you about the OPERA cohort, again, a large cohort of people now being administered cabril piverine, really exciting, high rates of virologic suppression, still virologic failure in the one to 2% range, really exciting. Um, and then, you know, he mentioned this study. I wanna take a minute and tell you about this. This was a study done in Southern and Eastern Africa. It was Kenya, Uganda, and South Africa. And it was a pragmatic trial. They only checked viral loads. These are people with HIV um, every um, 24 weeks. So every six months, it was a public health approach. These were people who likely had high rates of NNRTI resistance. They didn't do genotyping up front. They did have to be undetectable. They got randomized to standard of care oral therapy or long-acting cabril piverine. Remember, they're only being checked for viral load every six months. Crazy results. They did archived genotyping, really high rates of background NNRTI resistance, high rates of background cabotegravir resistance. It worked really well anyway. About 15 to 17% of these people, even though you were supposed to be undetectable, were actually viremic when they deployed the long-acting injectable. What does this mean about what it's safe to do with long-acting injectables in patients who might be viremic? You tell me. But it's certainly reassuring, especially when we are so concerned about it, isn't it? This is the other study that Dr. Sachs mentioned. It's called the SEARCH study. Long story short, Diane Havlier, UCSF, Uganda, randomized men and women to either come to a clinic and get oral prep and prevention services, or we're gonna do everything we can to navigate prep services to you and help you, and we're gonna offer you choices, oral prep or injectable cabotegravir prep. You can see the coverage in the different arms. The blue is this facilitated choice 
um, uh, uh, randomization arm, and the yellow is the standard of care arm. So coverage of these visits, extraordinary when you facilitate it. But what got buried in this CROI abstract was in the choice arm, there were zero HIV infections. So what is the take home message? That if you give people choices of prevention product and let them pick what's best for them and let them switch back and forth between them and you help them get the products, you actually can get zero HIV incidents. Short term follow up, but still, how exciting is that? What a concept, making products that work available to people and then giving them options. Who would have thought of that? Anyway, okay, non adhered populations. I'm already over time, so I'm gonna zip through this. Um, the the um, compassionate use experience with Cabril Piverine. Before it was FDA approved, the companies that make these products said, people who are desperate will let you try it, even if they're viremic. And the long story short is, people did okay. Short duration of follow-up, median 10 months. You know, 63% um, uh, of these people who were heavily treatment experienced and couldn't take oral ART actually got to virologic suppression. So that's reassuring. You've already heard about the Ward 86 data ad nauseum. You can get high rates of suppression um, in viremic people if you have really good wraparound services. Is this ready for prime time? You tell me. Um, Mississippi, 12 patients, high rates of undetectability, viremic. Not, they did have to hire a full-time RN to administer this program, resource intensive. They found people, they made sure they got their injections. You can do it, but it's resource intensive. Should you do it in everyone? Probably not. Should you do it, or should you consider it in people with low T cells who are viremic, who don't have other options? Is it ethical to withhold it? Okay, last thing I'm gonna talk about, promise, because um, you all need to get out of here, the latitude study. So Mike Sag mentioned, it's true. We paid people who were previously not adherent to go on oral therapy and get to undetectable, and then we randomized them to injectable therapy or stay on their oral therapy for a year. True statement. High rates of injection drug use, high rates of unstable housing, um, difficult to engage with populations in historical clinical trials, stopped early by the DSMB two weeks before CROI, and you tell me if you buy superiority here. The DSMB said, we're stopping it for superiority. Upper left corner here, the primary endpoint was regimen failure, which was assigned as virologic failure or discontinuation for any reason, okay? The incredibly rigorous early stopping rule, 98.75% confidence interval crossed zero. You do a back of the envelope calculation with a 95% confidence interval and it doesn't cross zero. Secondary endpoints, two of the three key ones, clearly superior even with the incredibly rigorous 98.75% confidence interval stopping boundary. DSMB declared superiority. Adi Arana, who presented this at CROI, got a lot of trash talk with people saying, it's too early to declare superiority. The DSMB should not have stopped it. Personally, I think this is a really exciting result. I'm biased, it's true. Um, because I think this is gonna lead to a regulatory expansion for the context in which we can use this regimen. So I think that's really exciting. I will stop there. Happy to answer questions. It's late in the day. Thank you for your attention. Okay, we have a ton of questions. We'll try and uh, plow through them. And if anybody wants to come up still, please feel free. Um, any data on long-term efficacy in extremely high BMI, greater than 50, 60? Um, for, I assume for long acting. Long treatment. acting, yeah. You, you know, we, we don't. Um, you know, the, the, the phase three clinical trials are still in follow-up, so we're going to get data. Um, remember that BMI greater than 30 was barely significant in some of the retrospective analyses looking at predictors of virologic failure. I would not use that as a reason not to use 
um, the, these, these products if that's the only um, risk factor they have for virologic failure. Okay. Um, many patients on PrEP don't want to pay for this viral load testing. How do you address this? Um, <laughs> so I, I fix the broken healthcare system. <laughs> Um, I, do, I do think, though, um, my charge to all of you about this and in, the, in um, service to the future of long-acting PrEP agents, which is I do, I do think is where the field is going, is we need better, cheaper, point-of-care, more sensitive diagnostics, right? The field has been a little bit stagnant in terms of HIV diagnostics. We can create COVID testing and a COVID vaccine during a pandemic, you know, in record time that's extraordinary. You know, we need activism to demand better, cheaper point of care testing that can help us in these situations. Uh, do you wait for HIV viral load prior to giving your next cab injection for PrEP? I don't. Um, as long as you have a good way to find the person so that if you get a result that you need to, react, to act on and intensify the regimen later, I do not wait. I draw the blood and inject them on the same day. I think trying to have them come back multiple times defeats the purpose of the advantages of the long-acting preparation. Patient with normal creatinine worried about weight gain. What's your opinion? TDF, TAF, CAB, IM. Someone with normal renal function. Yes. Yeah. So um, we actually looked at weight gain in the 083 trial. Um, there is a difference um, in weight gain between the two arms, but it's entirely driven by the anorectic effect of the TDF-FTC during the first year. You get about a half a kilogram of weight loss, whereas in the cabotegravir arm, you get about a, a one, one and a quarter kilogram per year weight gain. Spoiler alert. In the phase two study of cabotegravir, which was placebo controlled, so cabotegravir versus placebo low risk people, weight gain was 1.2 kilograms per year in both arms. So there's bad news. We're all gaining weight. <laughs> <laughs> How often are you checking viral load in patients on Cabril? Um, in, in Cabril, great question. Um, we've been doing it sort of every four-ish months. If somebody has risk factors, we'll do it much more frequently up front. We may even keep them on monthly a little bit longer and check those viral loads before extending them out to the two-month interval. Personally, I'm somebody who's twitchy about the every eight-week interval, so I tend to start people on monthly and have them come in at least for a quarter, if not six months, um, and before I'll extend it out. That's nowhere in any guidelines, that's just me being twitchy. Can you see Levi with oral prep? No, you don't, because the bottom line is if you're in the same room as a tenofovir containing prep pill, you don't get HIV infection. So, and I'm only exaggerating a little bit, right? It's highly potent. So the people who fail oral tenofovir-based prep are, fail it because they aren't taking it, right? So you don't get that attenuation um, in the antigen antibody response. They did look in the partner's PrEP study and they, they thought they saw somewhere between a 14 and 21 day delay just using rapid testing compared to what they saw in the placebo arm. But my sense is that was just acute or primary HIV infection and not a true Levi-like syndrome. Um, for off-label Cabril treatment and non-adherent patient with low CD4, do you use Q1 or Q2? Q one month or Q two month dosing? Um, I, I think the, the, the spirit of having less interventions and having it spaced out to every two month is what we would like. Um, I haven't done it in this case. I think I would be more comfortable with every one month dosing because I would want to make sure that I was doing all of the wraparound services and counseling and making sure that they didn't have food insecurity and that I was addressing their mental health and other substance use um, needs if they have them all at the same time. Okay, we have four rapid questions. Do you do rapid PrEP initiation with a rapid HIV test only, like same day PrEP administration, or do you wait for blood tests to confirm negative HIV test? Um, I will do it, um, uh, both with long and short acting PrEP. I will um, do a rapid in the moment and then either provide a prescription if it's oral PrEP 
I mean, let's be honest, um, who is so lucky to be able to pull a vial of cabotegravir off the shelf and initiate it that <laughs> same day, right? Um, if I could, I would, but I can't, so I don't. Um, I, I try to have um, a full HIV testing algorithm resulted approximately within a week of when I'm going to start, and then I actually repeat it on the day that I actually am starting, but I don't wait for those results on that day to come back. How long do you counsel someone to take oral cab before they have significant risk reduction for HIV acquisition, or do you just say wait until injection after oral lead-in? So great question. So the oral lead-in for cabotegravir prep is also optional now. And again, you know, if you're thinking about using injectable prep because somebody has struggled with adherence, don't ask them to take a month of pills. It's not going to go well. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the pharmacokinetics, and again, as I mentioned during the main part of the talk, we do not know the answer to this. This is pharmaco pharmacokinetic modeling based on non-human primate data. When you take an oral dose of cabotegravir, you get what should be rectally protective concentrations within four hours of that dose. That being said, if you weren't doing an oral lead-in and you're just doing straight to inject for PrEP, you would get protective concentrations um, in half of the people 48 hours after that injection, in 95% of people five to seven days after that first injection. So if you're doing the oral lead-in, would it make sense to overlap by about a week? Probably. Is that in any guideline? No. Is that based on any data in humans? No. Does it make sense? Yes. What do you do if you're not doing the oral cabotegravir lead-in? Well, if they're coming from a tenofovir-based prep preparation, do you overlap that for a week? Do I? Yes. Is it in any guideline? No. Is there human data? No. If they're coming de novo, what do you do? You tell them to either be careful for a week or you give them a week's worth of pick your oral prep of choice to overlap that first week if you want to be super conservative. Okay. If care prep failures can be detected prior to NC resistance emergence, does that mean there's a scenario in which you would transition a failed prep patient to an NC regimen, for example, would a lack of, of NC mutations on their first genotype be enough to reassure you? Yeah, great question. So we talked about this a little bit in the cases. The problem is, you know, if you catch it by RNA that early, the RNA value is going to be super low. And most of the time, it's not going to be um, in a range where you can get a genotype. The, the way we did it in the study was we sent it to University of Pittsburgh to a research laboratory and they did like ultra sensitive like single genome sequencing. That's not going to be available to you. So the general rubric of what we've observed, and this is for individuals born male. We do not know the analog to this for individuals born female. Why? Because there were so few infections in the women. This product works so Comparisons are dangerous, much better for vaginal exposures than for rectal exposures, and it works really well for rectal exposures, um, that we can't answer this question. If it's within six months of the cabotegravir, ex last cabotegravir exposure, um, that you uh, find the infection, you're at risk for integrase resistance, and I would not use an integrase-based treatment regimen. If it's six months or more since that last exposure, you're not gonna have integrase resistance. That's gonna be in that tail phase. It's gonna be wild type virus unless there's something else transmitted. And in those cases, the viral loads are gonna be high and you're probably gonna be able to exonerate integrase resistance confidently. Okay, last question. Long-term su suppression or cure trials temporarily exclude patients on long-acting ART or defer entry for regimen switch? If a patient on long-acting ART switches to their previous oral regimen for trial eligibility, completes the trial, and now wants to resume LA long acting, should an OLI be considered to monitor for resistance, or OLI? Um, so let me make sure I got this right. Someone's on an injectable treatment regimen. They want to be in a cure study, so they transition from their injectable regimen to an oral regimen to let the injectable wash out, and they then participate 
And the question is, can they go they back on mm -hmm. an injectable regimen later? Um, or what should you do? Should you, yeah. I mean, right. If the viral load has stayed suppressed that whole time, the likelihood that you've selected for resistance is basically zero, right? So if your oral regimen has successfully bridged and there was not viremia in the middle, there would be no reason to think that you would have selected for injectable product resistance, right? You only select for resistance when there's viral replication in the presence of drug, but there hasn't been viral replication. So at least based on what I think I'm understanding, I'm not concerned. And if we didn't interpret the question correctly, come on up after. But that's the last question, and I'll just close with, with a couple of, of slides. Um, just to remind everybody that you'll be receiving an evaluation, and it's really important to us that you complete it. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, want to just point out this fantastic new podcast that ISUSA has put forward called Going Antiviral. And the esteemed Dr. Sag is um, the host for this, for this podcast. And we know that you'll enjoy it if you want to listen to it during your next run. Um, and um, you're all familiar with the, the large number of other meetings and updates and sessions that, that um, are hosted by IS USA. Next one in Atlanta, Georgia. We have one in Chicago. And um, an upcoming webinars. This one on new HIV drugs, um, antiretroviral management, updates from CROI, ART and STI prevention, implementation science, and thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you to our fantastic speakers and for all the great questions.